In this video, I'm going to be walking you through various lines and tubes. And the goal of this video is that by the end of this, you'll be able to look at this and be able to name most of them. Uh, and you won't feel that scared if you see something like this. For more educational resources, like our medical ID cards, check out medicalbasics.com. So the first case that we're going to go through is just a, a simple uh, feeding tube or NG tube. You know, you don't really know what type of tube this is unless you're the one who placed it, uh, simply because depending on the hospital that you're in, depending on the manufacturer that they're using, this could be an NG tube, it could be an OG tube, it could be a feeding tube, you don't really know. Let's say, for example, this were an NG tube, where exactly would you want this to be? Well, typically these NG tubes are, are for suction. What you want is you want to make sure that their side port is, you know, past the GE junction in the stomach and then the tip is in the stomach as well. Let's say we, and the way you look for the, the side port is you see this thin radiopaque line that goes all the way across. If it was an NG tube, there would be an area where uh, you don't see that radiopaque marker anymore. So it'd be, there would be a gap, let's say like right there. Here you don't see that radio opaque line and then let's just say that was the side port essentially if you're using this for suction that's not really an ideal location because that's going to be somewhere near the GE junction what you would want is it to be kind of more positioned down below you know if this were a feeding tube what you would want is you know typically you want it you know as far into the duodenum as you can um, you know third portion of the duodenum would be kind of ideal fourth portion even better and so oftentimes these will just kind of lay in the stomach and for feeding purposes that's not really the most ideal setting because you can imagine if they feed them things will go into the stomach and then they lie down and then everything goes straight back up going up so you know typically what you want is you want these ng tubes that are to suction you want the side port in the stomach you want the tip you know also in the stomach more deeper and then these feeding tubes you want them uh, well into the duodenum as far as you can get in there this is going to be an example of a feeding tube, most likely a weighted tip feeding tube. Um, essentially, it's, you know, down here, the tip is not really coursing in the pathway of where your esophagus would go. You typically like to see it go that way and then into the stomach. This one is going, you know, probably in the right main stem bronchus. So instead of it going into the esophagus, you know, it went into the airway instead. Uh, I wouldn't say it's very common, but it does happen. So it's something you want to look out for. Next thing, I mean, there's two lines here. The one that I wanted to focus on in this situation was your endotracheal tube. We also have a right internal jugular line as well. You know, typically where you want this to be, you want this to be somewhere, you know, in the mid thoracic trachea. You don't want it to be in the thoracic inlet. You don't want it down here in the carina. You want it somewhere in between. You know, this is a pretty adequate position. Typically what people will say is, you know, five centimeters plus or minus two above the carina. Um, that will give you room for for if you lift up your chin, this tube will go up. When you lower your chin, this tube will go down. It almost seemed a little bit counterintuitive to me, but it kind of has to do with just like lift, lowering your chin is gonna lower this tube farther down. So that's why you don't want it too close. It will move quite a bit when you position your neck going up or going down. So that's why you kind of want it roughly in this location. So this is a fairly good position uh, for the endotracheal tube. You know, typically, like I mentioned, five centimeters plus or minus two above the carina. Some people, you know, they say between the carina and the clavicles. The problem with that is that, you know, that could be true only if it's a perfect exam, right? Like you can imagine if the positioning of the patient isn't perfect, the clavicles could be here, the clavicles could be up here, the clavicles could be way down here. You know, there's so much variability. So I don't love this way that people describe it. But typically the crown is at the level of T4 or 5. So, you know, where you would want this to be is about like two vertebral bodies above there, more or less. This is an example. If we were to look at our endotracheal tube, that's this guy right here. It's coursing down towards the right. It's coursing down. It, our carina is right here. So it goes like that. If you can see it right here. The endotracheal tube is going down your right main stem. So what's happening similar to our NG tube case, it's not going that far, but it's just kind of going slightly in, and then you're gonna have a lung collapse on the left side. That's why you have this diffuse opacification. So this needs to be you know, farther up. It needs to be somewhere around here rather than in the right main stem bronchus. So that's just you know, another consideration. 
our next case, this is going to be a left upper extremity pick. The reason why I know it's a pick and not, let's say, an internal juggler line, we'll take that for the first one, that's going to go somewhere like that. If this was a subclavian line, it would go above the clavicle. And then here we know that it's also going to be a pick most likely because it's kind of coursing in the axilla going down the arm. So you just kind of have to uh, trust me on this one that this is going to be a pick. As you see more, then it'll be a little bit more clear. But these where you want them ideally is the superior cable at your junction. This is an okay placement. Kind of where I would have put the superior cable at your junction is about right there. It's superior cable at your junction is exactly kind of, if you break it down, it's where uh, the superior vena cava meets the atrium, right? The right atrium. So it's the superior cavial atrial junction. So the junction between the superior vena cava and the right atrium. So this whole thing right here is the right atrium. This guy right here is a, a superior vena cava. So it's probably like in the distal SVC, which is fine. It's, it's central. You really don't want it up in, you know, either the brachiocephalic. You definitely don't want it into the, the subclavian. But this is an okay position. Oftentimes these things tend to go up. So they tend to go up uh, either that way or or they go that way into, uh, you know, going up into the right IJ, going up into the right subclavian. If it's, let's say, for example, this was a left upper extremity pick. So just want to look out for that. Sometimes these things curl on each other. And so they, they get kind of clogged up in terms of it's not perfectly straight. So you just want to make sure all of that is straight. And also you want to make sure that there's no pneumothorax when you're looking at these. So this is just kind of a you know ideal situation of superior cavoidal junction. It's the border of this right lateral heart border, and then the superior vena cava, which is this this line in in blue, and then the right atrium is a line in red. Um, so that's roughly where you want it. As you see more, it'll become a little bit clearer. What becomes more difficult is when let's say the diaphragm is all the way up here, and then you don't really know where exactly it it should be. So you kind of just have to have a rough estimate of kind of where the contour goes wider where the right atrium is that's kind of the start of that is more or less your superior cavial junction so this one is an example looking at these two lines i mean there's a few things one is this endotracheal tube is too deep it's you know it's in your right main stem like we saw before here here is like your carina right there so it's still causing the same opacification and then this left upper extremity pick it's not going in the expected location because remember there's, there's a few things that you need to watch out for. One is that your IVC is on your right side. Your aorta is on your left side. So this could be a few things. One is, is it you know in your art arterial system, which would be very bad. The other thing is, is it, could it be in, in another vessel, for example? There's a lot of branches that come off of the subclavian. Could it be like an inner? inferior mammary, th things of that nature. So those are things you need to watch out for in terms of positioning. Regardless, this is in, in the not correct position. This one happens to be in a left internal mammary vein. And like I'm showing here, there's many different branches off of you know the brachiocephalic of the subclavian, but more so just important to know when things are in the correct position and when they're obviously not in the correct position. This next one, if you've seen the pneumothorax video before, this is, you know, obviously a large pneumothorax right here. This whole thing outlines the border of the lung. So what this is showing is your chest tube. And there's a few things you want to know about the chest tube. Namely, that one, there is a chest tube to make sure that this pneumothorax is being addressed properly. But the other thing that's very important is the side parts. Right, so in this situation, there happens to be two side ports. Uh, you know, not every chest tube is designed the same way that there's two side ports. Some have one side port. So fluid can go in this way, and fluid can go in through the the side port. But then you you see here, there's another side port that's outside the chest wall. So fluid could go out there. Air could go in this way. So this is not in an ideal situation. This needs to be repositioned. Um, namely, this has to go in deeper because you cannot have a side port that's in in the chest wall. So those are the main things that you want to just be aware of. When you see a chest tube, always look at a prior, see how it has changed in the interval. This is another one where we have a chest tube. We don't clearly see where the tip is, but I think if I were to window this for you properly, you would see that the tip is just barely into the barely into um, the, the pleura, and then you have all this you know, subcutaneous gas. And if I were to window it again, and trust me when I say this, this, this was the side port. So this again is another situation where it's probably just been pulled out 
rather than just not put in the right position. It's probably actually was originally in the right position, patient moved, and it got pulled because that happens fairly frequently. End of tracheal tube, you know, somewhere in the mid uh, thoracic trachea, this is an okay position as well. Next one is going to be some of our lines that we have. We've alluded to this before. This is our right internal juggler central line. And the other things that you would want to make sure it's not is, like I was saying before, is it a subclavian? Is it a pick? Those are kind of the more normal courses of those two lines. This one's pretty clearly going to be a right internal juggler line. I would put this as a superior cava junction where the superior vena cava meets the right atrium. And so this is in a good position. You just want to make sure these are not either too deep into the right atrium. You would not want the central line to be in the right atrium. Uh, that's not really its intention. It can cause a lot of ectopy. And imagine it can, if you have this catheter that is kind of rubbing against the wall of your heart, it, it can cause a lot of uh, arrhythmias and things of that nature. So that's what you want to look out for. The next thing is going to be somewhat of a similar line. Essentially, these are, and I'll show you in just a second. I should have a slide to show you how these are kind of placed. But this, this is a chest port. Essentially, this is buried, tunneled into the skin. This portion is tunneled under the skin as well. And then it, it links up into your internal juggler. And then same position is you want it to be at the superior KVOHO junction. Oftentimes, these can be either short or long. The main thing is you just want to make sure that it hasn't changed because whoever put it in, hopefully it put it in in a decent position. You just want to make sure that these haven't migrated either getting pulled out, probably is not going to be pushed in farther than the prior. But yeah, you just want to make sure if it's the first time it's being put in, make sure it's not too deep is going to be the big concern or too high. So like I was saying before, these are tunneled um, in the skin. Um, and so this, this is actually a dialysis catheter, a setup for a dialysis catheter. But they work pretty similarly in terms of if this were a, a tunneled dialysis catheter, it would work identically except instead of this chest port being under the skin, this component of it, so from here up, that would be um, outside of the skin, more so from here out, not this portion. You still want that in the skin, but more so that would be sticking out of the skin so that they can access it and do dialysis through that. I forgot to mention that if you haven't seen these chest ports, these are typically done when people have cancer. They, they administer chemotherapy in here, but essentially you have a lot of different devices. You have This is your tunneler that you use to essentially get uh, the tube that you're going to put into the... If you've ever put in a, a normal central line into the right IJ, it's the same thing except the tip, instead of it going up and out into the neck outside of the body, that part is going to be tunneled under the skin and it's going to attach to this, this port. Um, and this port is what they access to um, deliver uh, medication. So same concept as a central line or as a dialysis line, similar concepts, but just a little bit different in terms of the utility and also what it should look like. This is going to be a little bit different of a line. It's still going to be an internal juggler central line. Technically, that's what it is. But you can tell by the thickness of it. If you've seen enough of these, this is going to be a dialysis catheter. You know, typically these dialysis catheters have to be fairly thick because you have to both put the blood back in, take the blood out, like into your actual dialysis machine. So it has to have two passes. Essentially, it's almost like having two central lines, but you're only physically putting in one. Some of these even have three lumens to them, so they can be quite big. The one major thing is ideally these are actually in the right atrium rather than at the superior cavoidal junction. The purpose of them are different. Their ideal location is actually in the right atrium. So that's why this one you will say, oh, it's so deep. If this was a right internal juggler central line, just a simple central line that you're um, either giving for IV fluids or whatever in the ICU, you would say that's very deep. But for these dialysis catheters, actually that's where you want them. So that's why I bring that up. This next case is a case where, well, we have a few lines. One is their endotracheal tube. It's in the mid-thoracic trachea. I'm, I'm happy with the position of that. The line that I'm wondering about is, well, this line right here. So I'm following it, following it. Okay, it looks okay. I move on to the next case. Well, actually, when you go to the bottom, you see that if you weren't paying close enough attention or you missed it when it was up here, you'll see there's a portion of this. And some people may think, oh, this might be external. But actually, if you trace this one back, you'll see that it actually is kink. So this is probably some type of NG 
tube that got kinked and now the tip is somewhere in the mid esophagus. So that's going to need to be completely taken out and repositioned, scan them again, whatnot. This one is, I guess, a, a much more severe case of, of the one prior. First off, they have a lot of surgical clips in their neck, so presumably they're some type of, you know, ENT type patient that they probably had some type of cancer. Um, and so whenever you have cancer patients, especially ENT patients um, that are post-op, when they put in these tubes, sometimes they just don't want to go down. So this one's probably kinked somewhere and then it's coming back out. This is an NG tube going through the nasogastric system. It's coming out and, you know, it's kind of unclear what, what's happening once it gets here. But I think what's probably happening is kinked down here. It comes back up and it's kinked again. So that's why, because otherwise you wouldn't be taking this plain film because they're probably trying to figure out where is the tip. Because if it completely came out and this is outside of the skin, you would think that they would know and they would take this tube out completely. So probably they don't really see that it's looping back and going up into you know in an abnormal position. So that's kind of what we see there. So this next one is, there's a few um, devices in this one. Uh, what I mainly wanted to point out is this is, let's say this is you know yesterday's film and then we see this today. You know, what, the main thing you want to look at is what are the differences between the two. They obviously have all these median sternotomies. They're a post-op cardiac patient. They have this mediastinal drain. That looks to be the same. I don't expect these mediastinal wires to be different, but one thing you want to look at is, is there any breakage in there? Is there, you know, any fracture of any of these wires? So that's one thing. So that, that is not, I should be clear that there is no fracture of any of these wires. The other thing is there's an endotracheal tube. It was in a good position before, got taken out. So probably the patient's doing a little bit better. And then you have this wire that's coming here. And so this one, if you haven't seen one of these before, this is a pulmonary artery catheter. It's a Swan, if you've heard of the Swan Gans catheter, essentially it's going to go, you know, your right IJ, SVC, into your right atrium, right ventricle, and then it's going to go into your main pulmonary artery. So it can be in your main pulmonary artery. It sometimes can be into your right or left pulmonary artery as well. If it ever gets into a segmental branch, that's going to be you know, definitely malpositioned. Here, if you look at between here and here, you know, this one now is in probably a left pulmonary artery system. It potentially could be in a segmental branch. It may be okay in this position, but it is definitely different. So, you know, this is just something that uh, it, it could potentially be pulled back a little bit, but it's in a okay position, but not ideal. That's how I would phrase it in terms of for you to, to know. It's, it's, it's not in the best position, but it could be worse if it was in, in some type of segmental branch. So this last case that I want to show you is going to be two different devices that we haven't seen before. First off, we'll just talk about that. There's the endotracheal tube. There's some line in the right internal jugular. We don't really see the tips. So we don't know exactly where it is. But we have two other devices. One is this big guy right here. This is a pacemaker. It's a left chest wall pacemaker. And there's different leads. There's some that are single lead. There's some that are dual lead. There's some that are three lead. And this one happens to be three lead. You got one that is going into the uh, right atrial appendage. So uh, in a, the appendage of the right atrium. You have one that's going to go into your right ventricle. And you have a third one that's going to go to the left ventricle through the coronary sinus. That's kind of those three. You don't always have to have all three. Like I said, you can just have a single lead pacemaker. It kind of depends on what uh, function you want. This one happens to be uh, one that uh, probably has ICD capabilities. It can essentially defibrillate you rather than, you know, a single lead pacemaker that just in the right atrium. It, it can just pace you, um, if that makes sense. And you just know based off of how these look that they have different functions to them. But it's not entirely important, you know, the different types of pacemakers. Really, you just want to make sure all the leads are going in the areas that you expect. Because sometimes if you look at priors and then you look at your current one, you know, your right atrial lead may go like this. And previously it was, it was pointing towards more like in this projection. In that situation, that's going to be abnormal. It's something that you're going to want to uh, be aware of. Other times these leads can become abandoned. There's, you know, syndromes, uh, I think they're like twiddler syndrome or something to that extent, where these uh, patients essentially like to 
play with their leads in their chest because it's essentially tunneled and then these become kind of tangled up they can either fracture and, and no longer be attached to the device so that's one thing you want to watch out and two you, you just don't want this you know electrical wire essentially to be all tangled because it could be either pooling or it could be in the wrong position the other device that i wanted to show you is one that you may or may not have seen actually a lot of attending radiologists probably haven't seen some of these as well depending on the hospital that you're at is this device right here so um, if you've ever seen conventional LVAD devices they're essentially you know they're very big devices they're very invasive you know most of the times they're going to be bridges for your heart transplant because you're essentially putting in this big motor that's going into the left ventricle, sucking blood out of there, and then having a tube that goes to, that's connected to your aorta and pushing blood into there. Essentially, these left ventricular assist devices are exactly how they describe. If you have some type of severe heart disease that you cannot pump blood from your left ventricle, it's, not, it's weak, it's too weak for whatever reason, it's too weak to pump blood to the rest of your body but it can get to the, the left ventricle just can't pump it to the rest of your body then you need this assist so it essentially bypasses the aortic valve and this motor however it works i'm not entirely sure but this motor will bring the blood from the left ventricle and then go through the motor and then pump it into the aorta and then uh, mechanically push it to the rest of the body but that's pretty invasive um, and in this situation it's a little bit different if you just have some type of temporary let's say you just had an MI you're trying to bridge them they just need some assistance temporarily you put one of these intravascular catheters they're really just catheters that are going through your arterial system this portion of it is in the aorta this portion of it is in your left ventricle. It's essentially sucking blood, going into this tubing here, bypassing the aortic valve, and then coming out the other end into your aorta. And so this is a fairly new device, but a very popular one, or is being becoming more popular, that really is a minimally invasive left ventricular device, and it's called an impella. You should become familiar with this because this will be something that you'll see more and more frequently as time progresses. So hopefully, going through all these different cases, hopefully you have a little bit better understanding in terms of what the different devices are and kind of some of the pitfalls that you'll be looking for in order to determine whether or not they're in the correct position or they're in abnormal positions. Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our progress notebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.